Howdy doody, everybody. Welcome back. It's League on Lock. Eric and Mark here with you beauties for uh, all of a sudden certified banger matchup on a Thursday in the LPL. Oh, the LPL. They know that we got to get delivered a banger. They know that we didn't get the Gen G T1 excitement that we were so deserving of. LPL says, I got your back, boys. We got you on a Thursday delivering a banger between top esports and, oh, baby, you're going to love this one, JDG. And that's the thing. They would have known preseason. You knew this was going to be a smashing matchup, which is even crazier that it's on a Thursday. But I ain't complaining. And this one, I'd say, lived up to the hype. First and foremost, when I'm watching this series, you could feel... Not the teams being tentative, but making sure they make no mistakes because they obviously respected each other. So especially the first two games, it was definitely slower paced, making sure no errors came in. Slower pace from from the LPL is what I will say for sure. Yeah, I think a little fast more pace for the LCS. <laughs> yeah, pretty regular pace or a little bit quick for other regions. Game one gets underway, and hey. Looking pretty decent for top esports because you guess what? 369 finds himself a nice little advantage, gets a little bit of help from Tian as well. And it is off to the races for top esports, even at a slightly slower pace than compared to how normally, how blazing fast they are in the LPL. Yeah, and this series was entirely about the jungle matchup. That first game, as you mentioned, Tian was getting things rolling. He gets first blood in the bot lane. So Jackie Love and Mako feeling good on that Callista Renata bot lane duo. And remember, this is Sheer starting for JDG and only his second ever LPL series. And he's matching up against the king of the top lane in 369. But yeah, that first game, Tian got things rolling on. It wasn't even just about the jungle matchup. It was about Lee Sin in this series of all champions right now in this meta, but uh, TES slowly uh, roll over in that first game, but game two, Kanavi said, you know, that's cute. You got a world skin on the Lee Sin Tien, but let me show you how to play this pick because games two and three, it was all about Kanavi on that Lee Sin and he picks up double MVPs. And the curious thing is, why isn't Tian giving 369 more love in the top lane when he's matching up against a rookie? I can accept it in that second game. And when you examine that second game, you really do see that initial shift in this series to that focus on the jungle and how Kanavi was going to impact more or less the top side of the map and make sure that Sheer was either getting through phases of the laning phase okay or being impactful later on in the team fights. And that was rewarded with a lot of good plays, a lot of assists coming through from our man in the top side. And in that game three, you see it capitalized and pushing even further, getting those advantages onto the Jack solo carry up in that top side. This was a good series from Sheer, good overall from Mr. Kanavi, making sure that that's the adaptation that they made in this series disappointing on the side of top esports not to recognize that that change was happening and have some type of counter punch because you know with how 369 has been playing if you got those resources there i think that this could have been a locked up deal for uh, for top esports yeah it's strange that they weren't emph emphasizing that and we know tian loves to give a lot of the attention to the bot lane jackie love had smolder in game two so i get it but i think going forward now no question the ceiling for this JDG squad is higher when Sheer is in the lineup. So I'm expecting the rookie to get pretty much all the starts going forward now. Yeah, this is an important thing to look at when you're talking about JDG and where we're going to see their power maybe spike up a bit more in the LPL. Because right now where they were hanging out, sure, you're at the very, you know, you're in that elite category, but you've got company in that category where last year you were able to separate yourself from even the elite level squads in this region. Having a player like Sheer and knowing that, okay, this is a very good start and that potential seems very high, could be a, a quick trip back to that ultra elite zone for JDG. And obviously, uh, again, Kanavi double MVP has got to highlight that again because he passes our Lord and Savior Milky Way for the most MVPs in the LPL right now. He's in fine playoff form right now i think this was the first game we got to see ruler on the smolder and uh yeah i mean pretty much as you'd expect 
Yeah, the a player like Ruler able to command the new champion very well. Uh, and as you mentioned with this JDG team, seeing this level come through from them and how they things can do, amen. You're talking about Milky Ways? Pretty good company being alongside Kanavi as the top jungler in the LPL. The main gripe I got from this series out of TES is we were seeing the trajectory. Cream was improving week to week, game to game. He was invisible in games two and three. Yeah, and that's the other problem that I think is in this series. Number one, not having that adaptation, not having that counter punch and providing that extra fuel for someone like 369 through your jungler. The other problem was Cream being more or less invisible, being a passenger through this series when we know that he has the talent to take it to the level and be impactful in the LPL. We haven't quite seen that fully develop or continue to develop during his time on top esports. High level of gameplay either way across the series, still feeling like these are two of the three best teams in the LPL right now. The Thursday bangers, they're just warming up because we got LCS playoffs kicking off with the official fraud watch. Cloud9 versus 100 Thieves. You know, loser of this one is going to be dubbed a fraud. But the, the question coming into this is, should Cloud9 really be as big a favorite as people seem to be talking about around the community? Given the names on Cloud9, without question. There is no question about it. What these players have already accomplished throughout their careers, what they've accomplished at the LCS level, what they've already accomplished a bunch of them for Cloud9. So, yes, it is deserved in that type of sense. I think when you look at the games and the results and the statistics that we have seen so far through the hard pudding, the hard proof in this spring split, no, it's not out of the question. I don't think they should be relatively favored in this type of matchup yes you can look at the individual players you can look in through the history and that's something that we can do and talk about what champions they play what they don't play pick and ban all these type of things and examine it that way to get that edge but right now looking at the the numbers and how things have played out through this split and even the head-to-heads i think 100 thieves has more than a fighting chance and remember, the last time these guys matched up was the insane game where Berserker gets a pentakill on Zeri and Cloud9 still ends up throwing that game in an almost base race ending kind of fashion. And that leads to how I'm so excited. The very first thing about this matchup that I want to be talking about, it's that top set. It's Fudge. It is Mr. General Sniper showing up for duty in this one. And I know Fudge. Throughout his time in the LCS, he's, you know, busted out a couple carries here or there. In the, in the most recent history, where he's looked best has tended to be on these tanks. More so towards that side, maybe not necessarily as carry or lethal orientated as we have seen before. Like General Sniper, very carry orientated and very much going to make sure that he's got the lethality on his side. In this meta where bot lane is not as impactful as it's been in splits before... I'm going all in, pick ban strategy-wise, if I'm 100 Thieves towards that top side. I'm making sure Fudge never gets to play Udyr or Aatrox. Maybe he falls onto a Renekton, but I'm counter-picking for Sniper as often as possible to really see what this rookie can do in playoffs. And if he can pop off, I feel like it's easier to carry through top lane than bot lane these days. Um I'm interested to see whether it'll be a continued philosophy for these 100 Thieves, one of the teams that we did recognize throughout the LCS in this split, taking advantage of the live patch, adjusting their drafts, pick and ban, of course, as well as what their own strategy was going to be and how they would force another team to react to it or be prepared for it. And if you aren't, we've got our strategy and we're rolling through it. And that was strong enough. We saw that with the Shaco pick early, you know, just a, a few weeks ago type of situation could be something that we're seeing in this type of one. It's not exactly the live patch scenario as we move into playoffs. Important to keep track of that change for the LCS. I still think that that type of strategy could work here. Still try, that type of belief uh, in your own drafting and own style. I'm still not convinced that wasn't just a, a, a Shaco pick to drop in to maybe make people question and force a ban come playoffs. I mean, how many pro players have you heard? Of they just banned Shaco in solo queue and have for years just because they don't want to play against that garbage. Maybe River's thinking five steps ahead. 
Well, I'll I'll save you the guessing game. I'll tell you, you play against a Shaco that gets out of control, you're banning Shaco for the next couple of weeks in your own solo queue games. Get that clown out of my games. None of that clown business happening. The second matchup that I really want to talk about and look at in this one is going to be the mid lane. Jojo Pyun and Quid. That is going to be very impactful. And Quid has made a lot of strides and has been a vital part of what goes right and, and how the team fights go for this 100 Thieves team. And on the flip side, Jojo Pyun. We know what he is capable of. He is the rising star, the star of the mid lane in the LCS. He's got to step up and deliver that big money contract performance Cloud9 paid him for. And I think those two are pretty consensus across the board with most people. The two best performing mid laners from the spring split. So absolutely going to be a marquee matchup. Jojo has saved so many games for C9 uh, this split. When you look at the numbers, could not be more different in terms of really play style for these squads because you look at the goal differential at 15 and the early game numbers. Cloud9 is first in the entire league. 100 Thieves are dead last at eighth when you're looking at that goal differential, which obviously we've seen Cloud9 throw a lot of games and not know what to do in that mid, -late, mid to late game scenario. And 100 Thieves have been one of the best team fighting teams, even at a deficit throughout the split. It's one of those statistics that always can be that either or type of situation. Depends on how you're looking at a glass half full, glass half empty type of one. But you're talking about this one, Cloud9, getting those early advantages. That's fantastic. They can play that early aggression. They can set that opponent behind and have that snowball ready to go. Except the problem is Cloud9's not really pushing that snowball over the hill too much. They're kind of forming it and letting it sit there on, on stable ground as opposed to getting it rolling and keeping They're it They're just building. building a snowman out of it and admiring it. Ah, damn. Yeah, good. but a, a snowman <laughs> built by one small snowball on top of another small snowball is not building it up. You got to roll it, get big type of situation. And that's rolling what the 100 Thieves are doing. They're very slow. They're getting you know, very, very careful getting that first push going. But they're getting that snowman built. And that snowman is of stature and size when it is coming through. So that is where it is with the 100 Thieves. Are we going to have a time where they can get through that early game, stomach it, being within striking distance, that it matters when you get to these mid to late team fights and they start to take control? I want 100 Thieves to win this series just to kind of shut up a lot of the people talking smack about them. And number two, all of a sudden then you put this Cloud9 roster in the do or die lower bracket where they have really have to look at themselves and be like, all right, we really got to smarten up here because we're way better than this. I want to see an angry Cloud9 running through that loser's bracket. I can see that being a benefit. I can see the players, the type of personality on this Cloud9 team responding in that type of way. I can also see it going the other way is the problem is one of these type of ones. It could be a make or break type of moment for this roster, for this iteration of Cloud9 to really dig down deep and really find what they're capable of, win or lose in this series against 100 Thieves. I think this is kind of the tipping point if you will, at this point, to decide whether we're going to be this elite dominant force of the LCS, this outright front runner, or whether we're going to have our issues and struggle and be one of these teams that gets mixed in with the middle of the pack. Either way, must see TV to kick things off in the LCS playoffs. But that is it today for League Unlock. Eric and Mark here with you beautiful people. Thanks for watching, as always, and we will catch you on that flippity flip.